Good evening and welcome to the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen Artisan Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Victoria Dangle and I'm the Executive Director of the General Society. The program is supported in part by public funds from the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs in partnership with the City Council, as well as the generous support of the Friends of the Artisan Lecture Series. For those of you not familiar with the society, we were founded in 1785 by the skilled craftsmen of the city, artisans who represented 22 different trades, including carpenters, saddlers, tailors, and silversmiths, among others. Today, our 231-year-old organization continues to serve the people of the city of New York through our educational and cultural programs, which include our Mechanics Institute, our Tuition-Free Mechanics Institute, the General Society Library, and our nearly two-century-old lecture series, of which the Artisan Series is a part. The space you are in tonight is the library of the General Society. Founded in 1820, it is the second oldest library in New York City and one of the city's three remaining mem membership circulating libraries. After the program, I invite everyone to look upstairs where you'll find the Mossman Lock Collection, which is a collection of 350 locks and keys that um, are examples of late 19th and early 20th century bank vault technology. And so tonight we gather once more to pay tribute to the art of craftsmanship. The Artisan Series has committed itself to giving voice to internationally known artisans who will talk about the intricacies of their specialized crafts. The mission of the Artisan Lecture Series is to promote the work and art of skilled craftsmen to assist in ensuring that their unique knowledge is understood and carried forth for future generations. This evening, Glenn Bornazian, President and Principal Architectural Conservator for Integrated Conservation Resources, along with his colleagues Jennifer Shork and Christy Lombardo, will discuss the varied skills and equipment required in the design of architectural conservation programs for historic buildings and monuments from the perspective of the artisan and the scientist. Each speaker will address their own area of expertise and prevent this in, present this information by reviewing some recent ICR projects, including the conservation of four temple complexes at Anchor, Cambodia, the cloister at Saint Trophim in Arles, France. Um, in 1988, Glenn Bornazian founded Integrated Conservation Resources and Integrated Conservation Contracting Incorporated in order to combine investigative architectural conservation services with high quality conservation and restoration contracting and provide technical services for historic buildings and monuments. After studying at Columbia University's graduate program in historic preservation, Glenn served as sta staff conservator for the Center for Preservation Research at Columbia University and as director of restoration for the Nantucket Historical Association. Christy Lombardo received her Master of Science in Historic Preservation with an emphasis in building conservation from the University of Pennsylvania. Prior to joining ICR, she worked as a teaching assistant for UPenn International Conservation Seminar in England. And Jennifer Shork received her Master of Science in Historic Preservation with an emphasis in architectural conservation from Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture, planning and preservation. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Glenn Bornazian, who will begin the program this evening. Thank you. Thank you and good evening. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, as Victoria said, my name is Glenn Bornazian. I'm um, an architectural conservator and founder of uh, both Integrated Conservation Resources and Integrated Conservation Contracting where at ICR, we're a group of architectural conservators who design conservation programs for historic buildings and monuments. And at ICC, we're a group of uh, specialized craftspeople trained in the theory and philosophy of historic preservation, where we implement and carry out craft techniques that allow architectural conservators to reach the goals that they design for specific projects. 
Then after I give you a, a brief introduction about what we do and how we do what we do, I'll talk about one or two projects, as Victoria said, in general terms. And then Christy and uh, Jennifer will talk in more detail about two recent ICR projects. The um, Veterans Room at the, um, or, or the Tiffany Fireplace at the Veterans Room, it's uh, the Park Avenue Armory, and at Trinity Church, where ICR and ICC actually did a design build project where we designed the methods and materials for the conservation of the church. Uh, we worked with the owner to help them understand what those priorities were, what the costs were associated with the different extents that were there, and then the craftspeople at ICC actually implemented that project. So uh, two exciting projects for us and for ICC, ICR and ICC the people there. So looking back, I find what has drawn me to this field is a deep appreciation of what creative people can design combined with what a talented group of people can build with their hands. When the best of what people can do in both these fields comes together, what results can be quite awe-inspiring. Over the last 29 years, we at ICR and ICC have been extremely fortunate to have had the opportunity to work at some of these sites. Although periods of construction and geographical location vary tremendously, the same basic human creative spirit to design and build is there in each one of our projects. Uh, this is a, a series of slides uh, about the TWA Flight Center at uh, T Kennedy Airport, which I talked about in detail in my last presentation a few weeks ago. But it, here is Aero Saarinen, and I think this is actually Cesar Pelli in their uh, studio in Michigan, working with a, a model uh, to design the building. And it's interesting to think that back then, there were no computers to generate any three-dimensional models to understand what the space would look like. So they're basically trying to figure out exactly the way they want that space to look, and then they actually started to take measurements from those models and then use those measurements and relationships to start doing their construction documents. So an extremely creative process. And then here on site, the, this is one of the shells with all of the, um, with all the rebar inserted. The team is finishing up, making sure that all of the rebar is in, is in exactly the location that it needs to be. Here are the skylights framed out. And uh, that's, I think, a picture that was taken right before the first pour was done. And the first, each pour or each shell had to be poured at one time. So they had to make sure to get everything perfect because once the cement started being poured, there was no stopping. And then here is the final result. Uh, I was reading the description of the artisan lecture, which states that it promotes the work uh, and art of skilled craftsmen to assist in ensuring that their unique knowledge is understood and carried forth for future generations. What probably separates us from most of the people that presented this lecture series is that we are not skilled craftsmen whose trade designed or constructed such important structures. However, we are the designers and craftspeople who, deep, who deeply appreciate what such art architects and craftspeople were able to accomplish and who can design and implement, implement programs that, we, that will preserve their work for future generations. So this is a project that we worked on with the World Monuments Fund. As Victoria said, it's, um, uh, we, we worked on, the, the World Monuments Fund is working on four temple sites in Cambodia. I'll talk a little bit more about it in a few minutes. But this is Angkor Wat, the largest temple site at Angkor, I think actually the largest temple in the world. And this is the churning of the Sea of Milk Gallery there, which uh, had been restored by another group of people in the, I think, 1980s. And they used the cement in the process that had a lot of calcium sulfate in it. And that solubilized after a number of rainstorms and worked its way down into the sculpture below, which is a sandstone that has a tremendous amount of clay in it. So as the, as the water seeped down with the salt in it and it got absorbed into the clay and it, it uh, crystallized when it dried, the, it started popping off the surface of the stone on a very sculptural wall, which, on, which is on the other side of this wall. So a whole 
program was designed, and I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about it as we get further along. So architectural conser conservation is the science related to building materials. The roots of the field can be found in fine arts conservation. A major difference, however, is that architectural con conservators have to design programs for materials that are exposed to the elements, whereas fine arts objects can be placed in controlled environments. Architects design details and systems into their buildings that work in balance to protect the building materials from exposure to the environment. Yet no matter what, short of moving a building inside, wind, rain, freeze-thaw cycles, and salt crystallization are all active pressures that constantly keep the exposed portion of the structure in a state of decay. Understanding the mechanisms of that decay, designing programs that do not accelerate that decay, and managing the rate are all a part of our work. As architectural conservators, we design our projects based on a certain set of goals. We try to save as much original material as is possible or practical. We respect the design intent of the architect and or craftspeople who were involved in the design and construction of the building. And we design materials and methods that are both physically and aesthetically compatible with the original construction materials. And we do all of this through a series of specific tasks, through archival research, materials and condition surveys, laboratory testing, field testing, the implementation of probes, the implementation of non-destructive evaluation techniques, and carrying out mock-ups uh, of potential treatment options. And as I go through one of the projects, you'll see each one of these at work. So as I was saying before, we've been working closely with the World Monuments Fund at these four temple sites and in, in Cambodia. And here's a map of the, a portion of the ancient city. This is Angkor Wat, um, which is the largest of the temples. This is, and that churning of the Sea of Milk Gallery is a project that we are working on, which is at the, uh, I guess it's at the southeast corner. And the other project that World Monuments Fund is working on is here called Phnom Bikang, which I'll talk to you about. Uh, the other two projects are here at Prayer Khan and Ta Som. Uh, they're, they're all extremely large complexes. They're all extremely complicated. There's a group of a, about 130 craftspeople, um, then a staff of architects and archaeologists and engineers that are there working on a daily basis. So I'll talk a little bit now about Phnom Bikang, which you can see here in these two photographs. It was actually the first site that the ancient Khmers came to when they came to Angkor in the 800s, and in the 900s they started building this. And it's the only hill, Phnom means hill, so it's the only hill within the ancient city. And this is the top of the hill. And they ended up basically cutting the top 25% of the hill off and exposed the live rock that was at the center. And then they carved the live rock to, to the shape of a foundation that supported all of these sandstone walls. So it's, it's a gargantuan effort. I mean, to think that a group of people would come in here and take 25% of a mountain off and, uh, and go to the intricate level of detail to carve that live rock to support a very, very systematic and architectural structure is just staggering. And when you're there and you see it, it's just incredible to think that people actually tried to do this and actually did do this. So just to understand it, it's a, the main temple is a stepped temple. It has these um, terrace shrines on them. And then surrounding the base are a series of brick shrines that all relate to uh, Mount Meru and um, Hindu mythology. And this is today at uh, Phnom Bikang. We have two cranes on the site, one here and one over there. There's about 80 people working to basically just stabilize the site and waterproof the, the terraces. Uh, so right here you can see some of the live rock that's missing. Those, are you, those sections are carved away and new pieces of 
laterite is, is one of the two stones that is predominant in Cambodia, are used to fill these area in. The terraces are then lift, the stones are lifted up and there's a waterproof membrane that comes through here. The terrace stones are then put back in place. And then if there was a stone terrace in place, it actually got removed so that the waterproof membrane can go underneath it, but it got, it was documented very, very well so that it could be put back in exactly, every stone gets put back in exactly the same shape or place and, and it has the same configuration when it's done. There's also, as you can see up here, we've worked with the Cambodian government to um, control tour or have tourist management so that it, before that was being done, people were climbing all over the site and actually damaging the site and they were uh, in, a, in dangerous situations. So it's been an incredible project to do not only with UNESCO but the Cambodian government and to work with other international teams there who are facing the same challenges but with uh, all different types of solutions and it's uh, one of the few places I think in the world where from a technical perspective there's a lot of sharing on such a large scale. So it's really been an honor to be a part of it. And the other project I'm going to present to you is also a project that we did with the World Monuments Fund, which is at the cloister of the Church of saint Trophime in Arles, France. And this is truly a mixture of of art and, and uh, science. Um, say, uh, Arles is right here in the south, in the southern part of France. In the next few slides, I'm just going to sh zoom in and show you. It was uh, also a Roman city for many, many years. Here's a Colosseum and a Forum uh, that still remain. There are other Roman ruins that are still there. And I just want to point out to you, this is the center of the city, in case you don't know it. This is the church, the body of the church, and here's the cloister. Zooming in a little bit further, the church, the center of the, the city, and the cloister. So the World Monuments Fund was involved in the, in the first phase of work, which took place on the front portal of the, of the building. Um, but we really got involved in the, I guess it was the late 80s. The project has lasted a long time. It was just, just finished about six months ago, so uh, I can't quite believe how long this project actually took, but um, we had a lot of different people working with us, and the Wor World Monuments Fund basically asked our company to be the head of what they called a scientific committee. Basically, WMF was trying to bring as much international knowledge to the site to help maximize the, the technical uh, work that was happening there, to basically bring as many things to the, the architect on chef who was working and help them, help him and his team choose uh, um, not just local repairs, but, but we're not local um, uh, you know, methods and materials, but to basically have the breadth of uh, all that could be could be used. So we also were very fortunate to work with some people who had been at the site a long time ago. A man by the name of Whitney Stoddard was a, um, an art professor at Williams College and he wrote uh, a number of books on Romanesque architecture in southern France. So he was on a Fulbright scholarship in 1954 and took pictures of every column capital. And for us that was fantastic because when we were looking at the column capitals in the early 90s, we could start to plot changes over those 30 years. And here you can see the same column capital in 54 and in 92. And the amount of damage was becoming exponential. And the amount of loss to some of the, uh, the carvings was becoming very, very severe. And at that point, this project became something that was uh, a high priority, not just to the local people in Arles, but it, to the Monument Historique in, in Paris. So as I said, a, a scientific committee was created. Uh, here's the lead architect, Francois Botton. Uh, people from the laboratories in, in uh, Paris and Norman Weiss, who was worked from Columbia University and works with us. George Wheeler from the Metropolitan Museum and also from Columbia University. And then there's a gentleman, Stefan Simon, who was on our team, who's now at the, um, 
Institute for Preservation of Cultural Heritage at Yale. So it was an amazing group of people and, uh, and amazing conversations and brainstorming sessions that took place over a long period of time. So one of the other aspects of the, uh, of the project that the World Monuments Fund made available was to laser scan the site. And basically in this picture, you're seeing the downtown, this is a laser uh, point cloud that the, I think the name of the company that did this was Cyark. And they, we asked them to focus here on the cloister and they, they got very excited about the project and started to do a lot more. But we were just asking them to focus on the cloister and I'll, I'll show you why. But what, what they started to get was some extremely a detailed information about the, the whole area that they were scanning. And I know that they've made three-dimensional models uh, as a result. But this is the, the cloister with all of the, the noise that comes from the machine. Basically, this laser scanning device sends out millions of uh, beams and then the beams bounce back. So it's very quick to get the information from the field, but very labor intensive to try to start taking these and uh, turning them into images that can be used. So here is now the cloister after all of that data has been cleaned up. And now we're starting to see elevations. So this is one of the interior elevations of the cloister. And then from that, we can get measured drawings. So it was a, a phenomenal way of not only creating backgrounds for, for work that I'll show you that's so detailed that you can zoom in and see a specific stone and then annotate the condition of those stones, but it also served for the architectural team as a way of uh, having exact measured drawings. And then an, another way that I found extremely interesting and, uh, was to take a group in France took the point cloud and then made a movie from it. And the idea was to try to, when this project was done, make the information available to anybody. So if someone was sitting at home and they had access to a computer, how could they see the cloister and understand why it's so special and why so many people are spending so much time there? So this, this group in Paris made a movie from the point cloud. And if it... L'un des fondateurs de l'église d'Arles occupe la place d'honneur. Vêtu de son habit d'évêque, il est entouré de Saint Jean et de Saint Pierre. La présence des deux apôtres auprès de Trophime montre l'importance du personnage, the, considéré alors comme un disciple de Christ. Si le laser scan est d'une très really haute résolution, then you can actually take that scan and you can create a three-dimensional model and, um, and then make a mold from a model like that and then create an exact duplica, a duplicate from a laser scan. So the technology that's starting to spin off now from, uh, from this field is really staggering and how it's digitized and made available both professionally and um, to the layperson. I think is just really, really exciting. L'église d'Arles est représentée au centre. Placés aux deux extrémités de la galerie nord, Saint-Trophime et Saint-Étienne encadrent et protègent l'ensemble de l'édifice. Les chapiteaux de la galerie yeah. est figurent des yeah. épisodes de la vie du Christ. Il se suit. Un autre aspect du projet que uh, WMF a fondé était coming up with alternatives to mecha mechanical cleaning or chemical cleaning. As you'll see in the, in the next few slides, what happened in Arles was that there was uh, two uh, paper processing plants outside the city, and the air became relatively acidic, and so did the rain. And what ended up happening was, when, as you'll even see in New York, uh, when calcium carbonate stones come in contact with acidic uh, sulfuric acid, they basically create uh, calcium sulfate, and that basically ends up being, you know, comes to the surface of the stone, it's kind of sticky, it holds carbonaceous materials, and it turns black. So here's a stone, here's a piece of marble that is clean, and the reason it is clean like this one is that it's on the outside and is getting washed. Calcium, I mean, the, the gypsum is water soluble, and here on the inside you're seeing it, the, the crust built up on the surface of some of the carvings, and here's an area where 
this person, Vivi Pooley, who came from Greece, uh, cleaned with laser, with laser cleaning devices. So she was asked to come and she, her company developed a laser cleaning device that was, at the time, could clean a great deal at one time, not just a little speck at a time. But the more important part of it was that it mixed uh, UV and uh, IR lasers at the same time. And the ability to control the cleaning, both in terms of its intensity and its consistency, was something that everyone was very concerned about. And um, because previous attempts at doing that here were not so successful. So here she is running some tests. And then here, what we were looking for was we knew that there was a, a yellow layer between the black crust and the white marble. So we were trying to see, for a number of different reasons, whether or not she could consistently clean the black crust and leave that yellow layer, or if she could, in this one area, if she could remove the black crust and get down to the marble. And these were, the scientists who were involved thought that there were pluses and minuses for each, each method, but just knowing that we could or couldn't were really the, 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 the questions at the time. Another aspect of the project that was supported was a uh, historic research campaign that took place in the archives at, in Arles and in, in Paris. And one of the interesting things that happened as a result of that was that not only did some photographic uh, and drawing uh, material come out of that, but so a lot of written documentation as well. And we found out that in the 1840s, uh, Ville le Duc was involved in, at Saint Trophime and actually designed and implemented a conservation program there. Uh, it was drawings were there, um, uh, you know, descriptions of the work that took place. And he even described that in some locations the marble was so disaggregating, meaning the binding, the binder strength was gone, and you could actually, when you touch it, the grains of the marble were running, were going away, so that he suggested and, and what we think was implemented was a chemical consolidation treatment program in the 1840s, which is extremely unusual. And it was done with something called potassium silicate, which is also known as water glass. And that, we think, is that yellow layer that shows up underneath the black crust. So this is a picture that was taken in the, I don't know, 19, I think in the early 90s. But here you can see an area where the gypsum is, is gone, a, an area where the gypsum stays, and this intermediate zone where water is now getting underneath the crust and it's going through freeze-thaw cycles or salt crystallization, the crust is now breaking off, taking all the carving details with it. So um, I guess I can show you in this next picture, this is taking a sample of a piece of the, mar a piece of the marble and cutting it in cross sections. So we're basically looking, here's the exposed surface, here's the black crust, and here are the grains of white marble. And this is just in reflected light in a regular microscope. This is a scanning electron micrograph uh, that shows you the same thing, uh, just differently. Uh, so here's the, the black crust, and here are the grains of marble. And now you can really see that there are spaces in between each grain of marble. So uh, it's very clear that be below the crust, the marble was disaggregating, uh, although that treatment that Ville le duc might have used in the 1840s might have been OK at the time, there's a lot of alternatives now. And there hasn't been a lot of testing done to, to um, vet those alternatives, and one alternative at one building might work better than at another. So another part of the project was that George Wheeler, who uh, uh, really has specialized in the field of um, ethyl silicate consolidation on both sandstones and marbles, was hired to evaluate uh, different potential treatment options. And here you can see some of the treatment options that, that we chose. Uh, a very large series of tests were carried out, both in his laboratory, in our laboratory, and on site. And uh, through a very long and um, uh, you know, intense process, a, a consolidation treatment option was chosen and was spot implemented on site to, um, in locations where, that were disaggregating. 
another aspect of the project was to take perspective corrected photographs and then to use those as a base for annotating the existing conditions. So basically before any work was to take place, uh, the team was gonna, needed to go through and basically do a condition survey and locate every condition, try to understand the cause and effect relationships. That was used to then take representative samples and do testing, all in the spirit of trying to design a conservation treatment program that was, as I said in the beginning, physically and aesthetically compatible uh, with the material that's there. So here you can start to see some of those treatments, or excuse me, some of the uh, conditions being annotated, both with the image uh, of the capital there and then taken away. And then we, des we designed this user-friendly interface into a GIS uh, database. And um, what we wanted to do was put all that information into the database so that it could be queried, that, so those queries could be seen both in the text and, in, uh, and graphically. So that that information, because there's a lot of information, and if all of it could be put into a database, we basically felt that we could use that to prioritize, understand, again, like I said, the cause and effect relationships, and be able to um, sort of document the whole process of the work. So in doing so, we use this ICOMOS uh, uh, glossary uh, of terminology because we wanted it to be universal. We also use their uh, different category, categories of um, conditions. And then we added something additional to it, which was previous repairs over time. And I'm just gonna show you one more slide. This is sort of a result of a query. So you can put a query into this, these boxes and you can make them more boxes or less boxes. But basically you can ask almost any question, like show me all of the stones that were uh, treated with the ethyl silicate in the 1840s that are showing these sorts of conditions. And then something like this shows up that shows you those, those areas with the conditions that you've asked, and then here in text format where they are. So the next few slides are just some before, during, and after slides to give you an idea of, again, what some of these areas looked like originally and how they changed as a, course, as a result of the project. So this is, a, I think, an image that was taken, uh, I think in the, it could have been at the beginning, like in, the, in 2006. So here you can see the crust. The crust was starting to be lost in some areas. The, the, uh, the decorative carving was going with the crust, so Japanese tissue paper was applied in certain areas with uh, an acrylic that could be reversed. And then after the laser cleaning, you, know, you can see the difference. And then not just the laser cleaning, but the localized repairs and the consolidation treatments. And so when you look at the hand right here and look at it here, I mean, these were carved in the 11th century. Uh, and here, the, the level of detail that's there is just incredible. That's the good news. The, the bad news is that now we're, these, these things, these, the stone is being exposed to the environment. So the... The treatments are, were very carefully chosen. The, the maintenance program for the cloister is extremely uh, detailed and is extremely important to continue on a, cyclical, on a cyclical basis. Just again, you know, a before and an after. This one I think is interesting. Um, this was one that came out of the archival research. This is from 1888. We're sort of focusing on this column. And keep your eye like right here. Uh, well, actually, I can tell you, there's a head that's missing right here. And this is 1888. And during the restoration, somebody was like working between two columns, capitals, and they found something loose. And um, this is Bonnie Burnham, the previous president of the World Monuments Fund, holding a little head that, that came out of that area between the two column capitals. And here's that same column capital missing that head in 1959. And here, after Bonnie was holding it, they put it back in place. So I thought, <laughs> pretty amazing that it lasted this 120 years, like stuck in that little, little spot and no one found it. Again, you know, early, uh, a Whitney Stoddard photograph in 59, uh, 
2008 with all of the tissue paper and then afterwards. Same. Again, this is like sort of an overall of the northeast corner, 1888, 59, a little bit before the work, and this is today. So great, thank you very much for listening to that part of the presentation. Uh, I think Jennifer, I think Jennifer Shork is gonna start talking about uh, some of the more current work that we're doing, and I think the, the important thing about what we're trying to share with you at this point is how ICR and ICC work together, how the testing that we do in the field or in the lab uh, how, what it kind of information comes out of that work, and then how Christy will talk about how integrated conservation contracting takes that information and tries to apply it in the field and reach the goals that uh, we were set, so. So Christy and I have selected two of our more recent and local projects to show you this evening, the Veterans Room Fireplace and Trinity Church. These were chosen because each knits together the work of ICR and ICC, and also because these two projects were quite different in context, material, and scale, yet we still operated under the same basic principles of investigation and analysis to inform the treatment plan and the craft of implementation. The 7th Regiment Armory, now the Park Avenue Armory, is located on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Completed in 1880, this building fills an entire city block and served as the headquarters and the administrative building for the 7th New York Militia, known as the Silk Stocking Regiment due to the wealth and elite social status of many of its members. So just after the structure of the building was completed in 1880, it was furnished with highly decorative interior spaces. We'll focus here on the veterans room, arguably one of the most significant surviving interiors in New York City. The veterans room decorative arts was part of the American aesthetic movement designed by an all-star team early in their careers known as the Associated Artists, which included Stamford White, Candace Wheeler, and Louis Comfort Tiffany, among others. All right. So here, this is a rectified documentation photo of the veterans room taken about 10 years ago. You can see these lavish and intricate materials used to finish the space. Every inch was a careful aesthetic decision made by the design team. Restoration efforts were begun by the Park Avenue Armory several years ago. ICR and ICC's scope was the centerpiece of the north wall, shown here, the fireplace composed of blue glass Tiffany tiles and a deep brownish red marble. The room had not undergone an extensive restoration, and what you can't see here are the effects of time and movement at this north wall. Due to a sag or a slight drop in the floor joist just below the front of the fireplace, we suspect this happened many decades ago, there was a shift in the marble plinths out and down, causing corresponding outward movement of the left and right sides of the blue tile walls. This movement caused significant marble cracking, shown here on your left, and large step cracks, shown highlighted in red, where the tile wall had dropped towards the sides. Tiles had fallen off and had been collected and saved by armory staff over the years. So when we arrived to begin our investigation, conservation work in other parts of the room was in full swing, including here above the fireplace. In order to fully assess the situation, we conducted a conditions survey on background drawings. This helped us better understand not only the conditions that needed addressing, but also the potential causes. On the top left is an image showing the degree of displacement in the marble that necessitated early fill repairs of almost two inches. Incompatible fills had been installed in place of damaged or lost tiles. There was heavy surface soiling on the tiles, and particularly on the marble, 
as might be expected in a 19th century entertaining space filled with smoking tobacco. Several cleaning tests were conducted to determine a safe and effective method of removing this built up grime to reveal the, material, the material's true color and surface sheen. As we continued with our close up investigation, we sampled areas of original grout to view under magnification and discovered an early blue coating on the grout lines. Behind a lost tile remained bits of original gold gilding, which we also reviewed under the microscope. So we're gathering all this information and formulating our treatment plan, but the biggest question for the project team remained, are the north wall elements structurally sound? We conducted a probe to provide access for the structural engineer to evaluate. And what he found after squeezing in this small space was quite troubling. The brick walls beneath the left and right sections of blue tiles were crumbling, unsound, and barely supported. Additionally, the original wood framing for the marble needed full replacement. It was determined at this time that almost complete dismantling of the fireplace was necessary. <laughs> Prior to removal, both the marble and the tiles were cleaned in situ. A thorough documentation plan was developed and each tile and broken bit of marble was then labeled and keyed to drawings. And so we began removals and disassembly. No. Power? <laughs> okay, well, I've just gotten a low battery sign here, so. <laughs> um, well, he's doing that. Uh, right, so this is, this is what was left of the fireplace after most of the historic materials had been removed. And you can see under that um, protective blue tape there in the center are several rows of tiles that were stable, and these did remain in situ. Otherwise, all the materials surrounding that had been removed. Thank you. Much better. Okay. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right. You're good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, so uh, the marble fragments that had been taken off of the fireplace were relocated to a separate temporary workspace um, to undergo a conservation. So you can see here they're labeled, um, and there were quite a few of them that we needed to keep track of. So the first step was to re-adhere these marble fragments to re re reform the panels. Uh, we worked with a tintable epoxy system, be and because the breaks between the fragments were not fresh breaks, the epoxy was used not only to glue them back together, but also served as a fill material um, where, the voids where there were voids between old cracks. Uh, the epoxy was custom tinted to blend with each repair location because of the distinctive figuring in the marble, so we had to, to design each location individually. To make the repairs as discreet as possible, after the epoxy hardened, it was honed to produce a sheen that was similar to the, that of the surrounding marble. So while we were reassembling the marble panels, the room was undergoing structural stabilization and key pieces such as the wood mantelpiece were reset into approximate locations. Also at this time, new steel stud frame walls were installed, which you can see there in the picture on the left. So with the key pieces now realigned, we could begin the process of reinstallation of the marble panels. A new supporting wood framework was constructed. This was covered with a modern cement board to provide lateral support. The mar marble panels themselves were installed using a system similar to what had been used originally to attach the panels to the supporting <coughs> framework. This in the, included the use of a simple piece of wire, um, though we used stainless steel this time around, um, and that was shaped to form a clip to hold the top of each panel. Some repair work was done after the panels are in place. In this instance, the corner was reconstructed with a conservation putty, which was then painted to blend with the color and veining of the surrounding marble. Conservation of the tiles was proceeding concurrently with the marble work. The tile conservation included regilding the back of select more transparent tiles. We also repaired tiles that had been broken due to movement of the fireplace. Uh, this was done using a clear conservation grade adhesive that had similar optical properties to the glass tiles. 
The tiles were then reinstalled. So this was probably the trickiest part of all the reinstallation, as at this point we had to work with all new datum points and mesh that with several rows of tiles that had remained in situ. Because of these constraints, it was not possible to simply run a string line to work from as you typically would in traditional tile setting. Instead, we had to adjust each tile individually to ensure that it would fit between both the relocated wood mantle at the top and the marble panels down below, and to ensure that it also matched up with the original tiles that had still remained in situ. For setting, we used a proprietary um, plaster thin set. Uh, it was important that this be white as it, it had to provide the right color background for the translucent tiles. And then the white grout lines uh, were inpainted with a bright blue paint color matched to the remaining evidence uh, that was found during the investigation. This restored the overall blue appearance of the tiles. So here we have the veterans, fireplace, veterans room with the fireplace, which has been realigned, resupported, and restored. And a detail of it there. Um, that's the finished product. And uh, Jennifer's told me that the fully restored veterans room is open to the public. So if you would like to experience the room yourself, you can. Uh, so our next project, something completely different, is Trinity Church, which is located in downtown at Wall Street and Broadway. And I think you can see the key differences right away between the church and the veterans room are that the church is a much larger scale project. <laughs> and it's, it was exterior work so that the techniques we used had to take into account environmental factors such as water. Um, this is a Richard Upjohn design building. Uh, the Brown Strandstone Church was constructed in 1846. With a steeple reaching 280 feet, it was the highest point in New York City when constructed and remained that until 1890. Uh, but now you can see the city has literally grown up around it. <laughs> Unlike the Veterans Room, the church has undergone several major restoration campaigns, one of which included the use of paraffin wax as a stone consolidant. This actually led to a buildup of soiling particulates, which over time resulted in the brown sandstone taking on a black appearance. The last major restoration campaign was completed in the 1980s, and part of this work included removing the black soiling to reveal the original pinkish hue of the brown sandstone. Our restoration work started in 2011 with the first phase of testing and investigation, which General Jennifer will go into. So our investigation began, as it often does, with the review of the soiling conditions on the building. There was overall general soiling present, staining in isolated locations, and the pervasive biological growth in some areas, particularly on the north side of the building, as you see here. A testing plan was developed by ICR to focus on addressing these conditions. Small-scale chemical testing was conducted, along with a microabrasive system, as an alternative to using chemicals. It was decided to use a combination of the microabrasive system and a biocide cleaner where necessary. So we started to look really closely at the mortars and found that several different colors and types of mortar had been used over the years in different repair campaigns. Careful sampling yielded original mortar from 1846, which in itself is an astonishing find for a building that underwent so much work over the years. We used several analytical techniques to examine historic mortar samples, such as x-ray diffraction, gravimetric analysis, microscopy, and petrography. In this case, basic laboratory mortar analysis indicated that the original light pink mortar contained no aggregate or sand. X-ray diffraction confirmed that the original mortar was a lime-based mortar. The original joints were very narrow, only an eighth of an inch at their widest. However, because the church had been repointed so many times, unfortunately, many of these original joints had been enlarged in ill-advised restoration campaigns. So the visual effect of the large joints meant that using the pink mortar would significantly change the overall appearance from one where the joints were not perceived to one where the joints became dominant. Furthermore, it's generally necessary to include aggregate in a mortar for joints this size to achieve mechanical compatibility. 
So based on the understanding of Upjohn's original design intent that the joints recede, the decision was made to proceed with a mortar that would visually blend with the stone. A physically compatible mix was pigmented to several shades of pinkish brown, similar to the stone color, and not too far off from the original mortar color, but a bit darker. And these samples were used to select the final mix that was approved for use on the building through mock-ups. We also looked into materials with which to repair areas of loss. To select an appropriate product, several proprietary composite patch materials were reviewed for physical compatibility. Properties that were laboratory tested include water vapor transmission rates, how quickly water moves through this water, uh, how quickly water moves through the stone and the patch material and comparing them, and compressive strength of the patch material. Because the brown sandstone used on the church comes in a variety of colors, we developed a palette of about six shades of patch material that could be blended on site. Now Christy will get into the work that we did. Right, right, right. So, um, is that better? Oh, geez, okay. <laughs> All right, um, the majority of the cleaning was done with the microabrasive system. And while it looks somewhat ferocious, it's actually a fairly gentle process. For example, in this cleaning scenario, we were using a PSI of 40, which is considerably lower than um, what you would see in a typical high pressure system. There is more skill, there is some skill required in working with this system as it is necessary to keep a, a, a consistent distance between the end of the wand and the wall surface and also to make sure to move the wand evenly in f fluid motions without stopping in one location. Uh, otherwise, there may be uneven cleaning resulting. After cleaning, reporting was done using the mortar that ICR had crafted to blend with the stone. On the right, you can see an area that was repointed 100%. The mortar does not match any one stone, but blends with the overall appearance. So for areas of loss, we used the recommended patch material. And patching is a multi-step process that takes a lot of care to install properly. The repair area is first prepared by cutting clean straight lines at the perimeter and removing the minimum amount of stone necessary to provide sufficient depth for the patch material. The prepared area is also dovetailed at the edges so that the patch material forms a mechanical key to hold it in place. This example on the um, upper left is actually a location of a previous failed patch. So in this instance, we also removed the abundance of anchors um, that had been incorporated into the former repair. After preparation, the patch material um, is custom blended and installed in two steps. First, a slurry coat, coat is placed to increase the bond between the patch material and the stone. And finally, the patch material is troweled into place. Typically, the patch material is built up um, higher than the surrounding stone and then carefully screed off to the level of the, of the stone. And the final step is the incorporation of texture designed to match the tooling or finish of the surrounding area. And a variety of tools and techniques are, are required to produce a final product that will blend in with the color and finish of the surrounding stone. Uh, here are some examples of our finished patching there. Another option for treating areas of stone loss is to replace with in-kind material in the form of a Dutchman. So ideally, um, stone used for Dutchman should be identical in both appearance and physical properties to that used originally. However, in this case, the stand, sandstone that was originally used at Trinity Church was from a quarry that's no longer in operation. We were lucky to locate a, a source of stone in the form of some very large boulders that uh, we found on the property of Lambert Castle in Patterson, New Jersey. However, locating a stone source is only the first step. The boulders then needed to be cut down into something a little more manageable. So the process of Dutch repair um, begins very much the same way as patch repairs do. The first step is to prepare the repair area by creating straight perimeter edges and removing enough stone to give the Dutchman unit room to fit, and typically this is a minimum of two inches in depth. Once the repair area has been prepared, the actual Dutchman is cut and then dry fitted into the opening. This is an example of a fairly large Dutchman that was completed in situ 
uh, because of the limited amount of stone that we did have available, this Dutchman was assembled in two pieces, though we do uh, try to avoid this if possible. Um, the Dutchman units were cut and squared off um, to fit in uh, tight into the opening. And this is actually the really tricky part as we aim for the Dutchman to fit within the opening with a minimum of, um, a maximum of a 1 16th inch perimeter joint. Though ideally we like to shoot for stone touching stone. Um, and then the Dutchman, once it's been fit in, it's installed with pins set in epoxy with grout used to fill any voids around the perimeter. The surface of the Dutchman unit is left slightly proud so that after installation, it can be tooled flush with the surrounding stone. The finished Dutchman is at the right there. Um, you can see that the Dutchman unit is slightly different color than the original stone. This is because that the boulders that we were so lucky to locate had only a limited range of color, primarily a dark red. So as already mentioned, the sandstone used at, used at Trinity contained a wide range of colors, so it's not always possible to obtain an ideal color match. This is a large unit at the parapet wall at the base of the steeple, and you can see deterioration along the horizontal bedding planes which make up this unit. Um, which made this unit and the keystone above unstable. Because of its size, this Dutchman was prepared off-site in our shop, but the method used was similar to that just described. First, the template was made. The stone was rough cut and then attached to the original mother stone. And the final step was to do the finished tooling using hand and pneumatic chisels as well as grinders. Uh, the complete win, what, cl completed Dutchman was dry fit on, in our shop and then reinstalled on site. And here are some other examples of completed Dutchman repairs that we did at Trinity. These are slightly smaller um, examples than those ones that I've shown you. So that's a brief look at the techniques we use to bridge the science and investigation of conservation with the execution and craft of restoration. You can see that there are similar approaches that we do regardless of the scale or the material and also techniques that are unique for each situation. Uh, both of these efforts are enormous and, and very costly. So uh, do each of these, Trinity Church and Anger Watt, put these out to bid? And then how long does that bidding process take? I would think it would be quite involved just to even submit a bid. And then uh, do they determine the bid on this is, this is what needs to be done for preservation. This is nice to have. And this we're going to you know, just fix every possible thing to be done. Uh, because these look like multi-year efforts and a, a wallet that's just enormous. <laughs> I, I'm just kind of thinking if anyone, if anyone has a home, you know, it just never ends. <laughs> right. Um, I think each, each project is obviously very different, and I think the Angkor uh, is out, you know, completely out of the sort of the world that we live in in terms of how that that gets designed and built. So, but I think I understand what you're saying about in the United States or how, how do we, how do people design a project like that? How does it, how does the owner make sure that the numbers that they're getting are competitive? Um, for Trinity Church, it's a complicated answer because there were two phases of the, of the work. One was design build that we did on the tower and the spire. And the other was, um, for the rest of the church, an architect designed the methods and materials, and it was bid. We actually did both of those. But it's a really interesting question, because in the end, I think the owner saved more money by doing it design-build, because there was no architect designing all of these drawings and specifications that, that take a lot of time and money. However, you need to partner with a contractor that you really trust, and you have to have some very good objective oversight to make sure that that project goes well. Um, I think another way of answering your question is that there are many different ways to do a project like this. 
Um, at Trinity, they didn't have all the money to do every little thing. So there was a very, there was a lot of time spent saying like, what are the priorities and how do we just address those? Um, as we got towards the bottom, the priorities or the, the, the level of detail changed because that which people could see, they wanted and get up to and actually touch, they wanted at a higher level of repair. That which was 200 feet off the ground, they just wanted to look its age, yet be able to stand up to exposure to the weather. Um, and it even went so far as if a mortar joint was cracked on one side, but not on two, it wouldn't get redone. So you know, and then, it, there were total priorities, and we had unit costs associated with every repair. So any time the church made a choice, we could multiply the unit costs by that choice, and we could show them how much money they saved by doing it. So then they can make decisions throughout the course of the work as far as what could be done. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we were trying to help them make those decisions before the work got done so that they knew exactly what they were getting into. But... Um, yeah, you can, I guess, even with a, a regular project, you can change, depending on the architect and the craftspeople, you can change the course of the work, but, um, you know, there's a whole sort of systematic approach to that in terms of change orders and costs and ads and deducts and <laughs> it gets very complicated in some projects. But we try to keep that actually very simple, and that's why we try to do both when we can, the design and the implementation, sorry. But, but that would mean though at the start in your initial estimate you had all those caveats covered and laid it out completely. Yes, and, so, oh sorry. Okay, and so the, the, should I understand that the answer is yes, there were multiple bids for Trinity Church? Uh, the was, answer is that in the first phase there was not, there was, it was design build, it was just us, so that means the tower and the spire was just in-house. And for the rest of the building, there were multiple bids, and we got the project. Right, because from the owner's perspective, you mentioned, or someone mentioned, that the restoration was done in the past, like 10, 20 mm -hmm. years before, and there were concerns about how that restoration would be done. So if you had the same owner, you would be thinking, whoops, am I going to then have the next conservator coming in and saying, well, that really wasn't done properly? Mm -hmm. um, it makes you leery about... Oh. Yeah. It makes you leery that if the, who, who designed it and then how long that, that repair will last. Right, because they all speak confidently as this is the way to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, I'm one of them. So, But I, I, the, I think the way we try to, to, um, to prevent that from happening is that we do all the testing and we do all the mock-ups and we... Um, you know, we actually even have peer reviews. So in the, even when we did the in-house work, when we did design build, there was a conservator who was hired to review our work and to make sure that it, the right methods and materials were used, they were installed properly, and that they were cured properly. So, um, you know, I do understand your, your point that sometimes materials change or a conservator might have had a certain approach and that approach might not have worked. But, um, you know, I think, we, we work very hard at trying to prevent that from happening. Obviously, you know, uh, techniques change, materials are affected in different ways, and there's no way we can guarantee that. But uh, I think sort of the, the whole field of building material conservation in the United States, which sort of started at Columbia in the late 70s, is all about that. It's all about trying to understand every aspect of the, of the work so that to avoid just what you're saying. How, how do you assemble the artisans for a, a project? Do you, do you do that? Does the contractor do that? Is it a shared process? And for example, on, in, in um, situations where it has to be maybe a, a union worker, I mean, so what, what do you normally do? Mm -hmm. You want to answer it or do you want to answer <laughs> Me? Um, well, let's see, I mean, we, on the ICR side, and let's say we're designing a project and it's going out for bid and we're not bidding it. We're just, uh, you know, choosing the contractor is extremely important and we try to vet the contractors who will be bidding a particular project. Um, in New York, we're lucky. I mean, there's a lot of very good contractors and, um, we write into our specifications how we want 
if a contractor is chosen, how are the mechanics that are going to work for them going to be chosen? So they go through sort of, um, uh, you know, mock-ups where we watch what they do, we watch the way they do it. Some are selected, some are not. Some can do these tasks, some can do those. Uh, but then the contractor is asked to keep those people on site, and if they're going to change them, that the next group of people go through the same series of tests. Um, you know, and then, like on the Guggenheim Museum, that which I talked a little bit about last time, we were so particular about the way patches were done in the areas where there was missing concrete because the building is semi or circular and the light comes in in raking fashion and little imperfections that are underneath the coating will really shine through or come through uh, at particular moments of the day. So we, when we were on site doing quality control there, we would actually use raking light to evaluate their repairs to make sure that, like say, if we were trying to mimic a, um, a, a joint line in the repair, that we just made sure that what we had sought in the design phase was actually implemented. So I think it's a combination of their ability as well as the quality control during implementation. Yeah. Uh, I would like you to ask, uh, when you do restoration, conservation, and preservation, you concentrate also on color and light, because this is very important. It, it needs to be close to nature, close the epoxy and all the technique, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not sure I understand uh, that, that we focus on the, the quality of the light. The, no, color, color and light. Oh, color and light. Yeah, it's very important. When extremely, you do extremely, yes. And, um, restoration and conservation. Christy is our color expert, but I mean, we, we do completely agree with you. And the way we, we deal with that in different situations is that, uh, you know, like we'll take samples of different paints that are on a site. We'll look at them in cross-section. We will try to determine what the original color was and how it changed over time. Um, and when you look at a cross-section of paint, you might see particular colors, but those colors can change and alter over time. So by UV exposure to UV light or, or whatever. So trying to adapt for that or understand what that paint is made of and how it might have altered is something that we think about when color is that important. Another way of thinking of the color as well is when, you know, in the lab we're designing the mortars that Jennifer and Christy were showing you. Um, you know, it's easy to take a, a, some mortar, some, what, a blend of cement and lime and pig, pigment and sand and just beef up the, sand, the pigment and get the color that you want. But when it's exposed to the environment and the cement binder washes away, it's really the sand that you see. So designing the sand to be the right color is extremely important if, to hold that color that you want. are interpreted by um, our own nature? They come in the way very natural, organically speaking. Agreed, agreed. I think, you know, uh, color, like again, let's use the Guggenheim just because I think it's a nice example. Frank Lloyd Wright was extremely uh, strong, it was, it was extremely important to him to, to choose the appropriate color. I mean, his natural organic building was sort of a response to the park, and he wanted or, an organic natural color to be used. Um, what got used over the years actually transformed that, and um, understanding how important that was to him and understanding what that color was originally was something that we did not only by taking samples, but there were, by doing archival research, we found original um, brochures of the exact paint that they used with his signature on the, right, on the specific color saying, this is, this is the approved color, let's use this. So um, I don't think people pay as much attention to color uh, as, they, as they do to other things. And it's, to a man like Frank Lloyd Wright, the building itself was extremely important but I think the color to him was just as important, if not more, in some ways. Uh, so I, don't know, I hope I answered your question. Okay.
Well, where is your lab? <laughs> Our lab? <laughs> um, 32 old slip on the 10th floor. <laughs> You're welcome to come by any time if you like. <laughs> At Trinity Church, how did you uh, decide, you, you used a combination of patching and Dutchman. Mm -hmm. How do you decide where to do a Dutchman and not patch? What's a Dutchman? Oh, the Dutchman is uh, what Christy was showing you, places where there was missing stone. And um, where there is missing stone or stone that's decayed, you cut it, that, disto that decayed material away, and you can either choose to use a cementitious-based patch to install that's colored like the stone, as Christy showed you, or you can use a natural piece of stone and cut it to exactly fit. Would it also be called a Dutchman when you're, when you're patching it? No. no. Right, no. that's what I... Th yeah, it's called a composite so repair. So what, what makes that determination? Wouldn't it be easier to patch to oh, yeah. the color? Yeah, it's, it's, it's easier to patch, uh, it's uh, much cheaper to patch, um, yet the longevity of the patch is not the same as the Dutchman, and the, the patch actually has to be more uh, vapor permeable than the stone, so you don't entrap moisture in the stone and start causing the same problem from happening. So it's not a, a repair that protects the substrate, it sort of is an aesthetic repair. So I think at Trinity, because they were trying to really uh, watch the costs, they only use Dutchman in locations where the, the damage was such that water could have gotten into the building. Okay. That was what I yeah. was wondering, and that would be a deeper... Structural. Or it was structural. A deeper structural situation yeah. as yeah. well. Yeah. I have one too. Hi, go ahead, Hi. Jennifer. Um, you referred to the, uh, the point cloud laser scanning um, at St. Trophim at Arl and the potential for uh, using high-res scans to generate molds for replication. I'm interested in your views on the current economics of that application. Um, will it be practical economically soon to use on real-world projects here in New York as opposed to you know, a museum-quality, highly-funded project? Yeah, um, I don't really know, know the answer to the question. I, I have seen people do that, and it costs a great deal of money. Uh, but you're right, it's in a museum situation where there's irreplaceable artifacts like at Saint Trophime. Um, also, people are using it now just in case there are, you know, uh, devastation or losses to architecture, the, they might not use that information to recreate it right then, but they know that they have it for the future. Um, I know also that you can take that information and put it into a CNC mach a machine. Uh, it's a basically a computerized um, carver, carving machine <laughs> and, um, and have that recreate the piece. I don't know what the costs are of something like that, but um, I imagine they're not cheap, but if you're looking to replace something like a carved column capital, uh, I don't think you could, it would, I, I, it would be interesting to see what it would cost to have a person actually do it versus a machine. Hi, thank you for the presentation, it was great. I noticed on one of the projects that you worked on, you used laser cleaning. Have you used that often, and what prompts you to do so? Um, no, we don't use it often, and it's being, though, used much more often. Uh, it started, actually, when the, the project you're, you're referring to was Santrafim again, and in the early 1990s is when the French government were, were asking people to test their laser cleaning devices there. Um, and it was at that time, it was just like, wherever the light beam focuses is where the cleaning takes place. And in the early days, the light beam was really, really thin. So it was like just a pinpoint was happening. And it was very hard to control. And it, the results were not good looking. And they were also, from a, from a conservation perspective, not um, appropriate because they weren't consistent. You know, you didn't just have stone. You had stone, on a micro level, you had stone and, and crust. So uh, over the years, 
the machinery has improved tremendously. The beams have gotten stronger and much wider, so the product productivity, the cost of it, is something that is now compatible with some other cleaning techniques. I know in New York City, they clean the uh, tympanums of the uh, public library with laser. They also clean the Cleopatra's needle with laser. Um, I don't think, and I know, I know there's someone who's doing a large scale project, I think at the, uh, uh, what is it, like the uh, parliament buildings in Quebec, mm -hmm. to clean the whole facade with laser. So there are now you know, machines that are coming out that can be productive. We, although we know how they work and where they might be useful, we really haven't had the opportunity to use it on, uh, on a large scale like that. Yeah. What separates concrete from cement? <laughs> really good question. Cement is when it's liquid, and concrete is when it's hard. <laughs> well, no, because... Susie? Because well, it's only like two parts binder to one part binder. Oh, oh, you mean from a, from a, uh, a mix perspective. Um, well, or is your question sort of what separates concrete from a mortar? Well, because no, like what separates concrete from cement? Because one uses, I think, two parts binder and one's one part binder. I was just. Mm, I, I think cement and concrete, the way I understand it, the way uh, cement and concrete are the same thing. It's just cement is when it's in its liquid form and concrete is when it's in its solid form. But as far as a mix is concerned, um, they're complicated, but they're usually one part aggregate to three parts binder. That's right. It's the Thank aggregate you. Aggregate issue too. It's, yeah. 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 Cement, cement, cement doesn't have an aggregate. Cement is the binder, and concrete has. Oh, well, whatever. You wanna? Let that one go. Okay. <laughs> I want to know if um, you use local people in Angkor Wat, and or do you train anybody? Yeah, the World Monuments Fund started working there mm -hmm. in uh, 1989, and they were. Um, yeah, they, they worked very closely with the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Phnom Penh, and they trained architects and uh, engineers after the war. And then there was a group of local people who they trained to be craftspeople, and now their sons and family are still involved with the team that's there. But the only foreigners that are coming to, their, to, to work there are sort of experts that are helping with waterproofing, engineering, um, you know, crane operators and things like that. <laughs> <All done. laughs> so um, we have a presentation to make. So for you. So, oh, yes. <laughs> Christy and Jennifer. So, and Glenn, Christy, and Jennifer, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and showing us the science behind historic preservation. I know I'm going to look more closely at, you know, we have an initial reaction to a, a restoration and we say, oh, Trinity Church looks beautiful. And, but now I really want to go and examine that more closely. <laughs> Anyway, um, so thank you for your participation. And uh, it's fascinating in terms of the science. I have to say, it, there were points during the lecture where I say, oh my gosh, it almost sounds like some pathology report <laughs> in situ and these, the analysis and all, and all of that. So um, on behalf of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York, founded 1785, we express our gratitude to Integrated Conservation Resources and Integrated Conservation Contracting for the artisan's perspective, how to integrate science and craft for historic building architectural conservation programs for the company's participation in the General Society artisan lecture series and thank you for the work that you do that that really um, employs artisans and and keeps these crafts alive so thank you thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you so much.